From the 1950s to the 1960s, the coastal populations of Japan were rocked by an epidemic that changed the way we view and process seafood today, leading to the death and permanent disability of thousands of individuals. This new disease, that had previously never before been seen, began to appear in hundreds of children, newborn babies and adults, as their nervous systems suddenly, over a period of days to weeks, began to shut down, finding themselves unable to walk and speak and gripped with repeated episodes of seizures. This disease, which we will discuss in a moment, brought about national and global reform, leading to one of the first ever investigations into the indiscriminate dumping of waste by factories into the deep and unassuming waters of our vast oceans. On the 21st of April 1956, five-year-old Himari was examined at Chisso's factory hospital in Minamata. The physicians were puzzled by her symptoms. She had difficulty walking, speaking, and was experiencing severe convulsions. Just a short time later, her younger sister presented to the same hospital, experiencing the very same symptoms. The girl's mother, in a panic, tried to recollect anything that could help the doctors to understand more of what was going on when she remembered that the neighbour's daughter, too, was experiencing similar problems. After a house-to-house -house investigation, eight further patients were discovered and hospitalised. Just ten days later, on the 1st of May, the hospital director reported to the local public health office the discovery of an epidemic of unknown disease of the central nervous system. Little did he know he had just opened the door to the nightmare that is now referred to as Minamata disease. Before methylmercury poisoning in Minamata swept news headlines around the globe, there were isolated reports many years beforehand, with factory workers and those living near the dumping grounds of factories showing the signs that are today all too characteristic of organic mercury poisoning. Despite mercury being used for centuries as diuretics, antibacterial agents and laxatives, symptoms presenting this acutely were an entirely new phenomenon. It is no coincidence that these incidents began appearing alongside the meteoric rise of the Industrial Revolution, for you see, mercury was used as a catalyst for making a variety of chemical compounds, and organic derivatives like methylmercury were used as crop fungicides in the early 1900s. Our understanding of the impact and relationship between ourselves and the environment was still in its infancy. And it wasn't until epidemiological evidence from Minamata was linked to reports in other countries that the hunt for this new disease could truly begin. Newer analytical tools in the 1950s and 60s allowed us not only to identify that mercury was the missing link between these cases, but it was in fact a form of organic mercury, known as methylmercury, that was devastating this community. When the chemical factory owned by the Chisso Corporation first began indiscriminately dumping mercury and methylmercury into the ocean in 1932, they had no reason to think any differently about the relationship between their activities and the strange symptoms the locals were experiencing. This was because it wasn't until the mercury entered the ocean that its true transformation began. Anaerobic bacteria, meaning bacteria able to exist in the absence of oxygen, use this new abundance of mercury dumped by unknowing factories to fuel their metabolism. But as was later discovered, they had inadvertently transformed it into one of the most toxic forms of mercury, methylmercury. This new form worked its way from plants all the way up the food chain until the symptoms began to appear in some of the most zealous consumers of fish in those waters, our feline contemporaries. One of the key differences between elemental and methylmercury is its bioavailability. You see, only 2% of mercury is absorbed into the gut, requiring much higher doses to produce the same toxic effects as methylmercury, of which almost 90% is absorbed into the bloodstream. As the methylmercury moved through the bloodstream, no organ was left untouched. In the central nervous system, it acted primarily to overactivate NMDA receptors at the ends of neurons, causing tremors and inability to coordinate voluntary movements known as ataxia and progressive insanity. 
In babies, the neurons were unable to even find and form the basic neural pathways to facilitate normal healthy cognition. The damage to the peripheral neurons led to tremendous burning pain accompanied by a progressive weakness in limb movement. This constellation of symptoms, along with the signs of direct kidney toxicity, is what made Minamata one of the most famous and deadliest examples of how our indiscriminate dumping of waste into the oceans has come back to haunt us. Looking back, some of the villagers may have considered the dying gasps and screams of the local cats as an early warning sign of things to come. Babies in utero were the worst affected. Not only were they more sensitive to the neurological damage, they also continued to be exposed to the mercury through their mother's breast milk, more or less sealing their fate. Now we return to 1956 as Hamari was put on a respirator and given supportive therapy as her muscles and movements continued to remain uncontrollable. Urine and blood tests showed signs of mercury and this is where the formulation of the doctor's hypothesis began. As the fears within the community rose, some victims that began to show symptoms decided to hide them, with rumours circulating that it was in fact contagious, which led to further isolation of those afflicted by the poisoning. But even if the patients had presented to the hospital, little could be done for them, as supportive and symptomatic therapy is all they could give once the cognitive and motor deficits had set in. Now despite the outcries and the formation of a theory as to the cause of Minamata disease, the Chiso Corporation is said to have continued to dump their waste for another 10 years, spanning an almost 40 year stretch from when they began and with little regard for the consequences of their actions. They did eventually succumb to the findings and reimburse those affected, but it would be decades before the waters of Minamata would be safe once again. We live in a vast ocean ecosystem, teeming with life, ranging from the most simple unicellular life forms to complex communicating animals. But despite its impossible depths, it houses a fragile ecosystem. The Chiso Corporation took this for granted and instead used it as a dumping ground for the world's waste. They alone, however, are not the sole perpetrators and the responsibility falls partly upon us to dispose and find ways to manage our waste effectively. Less than ever greater danger rears its ugly head. Mercury exposure continues to take lives and cause irreparable damage and I leave little to the imagination by telling you fish remain the most common culprit. But as the events of Minamata fade into obscurity, remember that mercury is still used in the manufacturing of many electronics and some studies have even shown cosmetics to house amounts well beyond the safe limits of exposure, waiting patiently to grip the headlines once more. Thank you for staying until the end and joining me on this journey to investigate the hearts and minds of the doctors and scientists that came before me. If you would like to support the channel, you know what to do. And see you in the next episode.